This video will be about post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. To understand glomerulonephritis, we must begin with the basic definition of what nephritis it is. As the name suggests, it is an inflammation, and here nephritis refers to the inflammation of glomerulus. So glomerular pathology is involved. Now what happens when the glomerulus is inflamed? To know that, we need to understand the paths of a glomeruli. So here I have diagrammatically represented it. Here we have the endothelial cells. And then we have the glomerular basement membrane. Here we have the epithelial cells. So these three cells mainly form the, endo uh, mainly form the parts of a glomerular filtration membrane. And along with that, here we have the mesangial matrix. So from the endothelial cells, the inflammatory mediators are released into the glomerulus. And as a result, what happens is that these inflammatory leukocytes, they will uh, cause a proliferative reaction. So a proliferative reaction will occur. And as a consequence of this proliferative reaction, we will have a hypercellular glomerulus. The glomerular, all the three parts of the glomerulus, that is the endothelium, the basement membrane, and the epithelium will be hypercellular, they will start to proliferate. In addition to that, the inflammatory molecules will also do a few other things. That is, because of the uh, inflammatory reaction, the capillary walls will get injured and that will permit the blood to pass through to the urine. So blood will pass through to the urine, leading to hematuria. The hemodynamic changes which occur as a result of the uh, rupture of capillary blood vessels will lead to a decrease in GFR and it will lead to oliguria. And finally, when this reaction occurs throughout the glomerulus, eventually what happens? The kidney will get damaged, right? And because of the damage of kidney, there will be release of renin as a uh, compensatory mechanism and also the blood vessels are damaged. And these two factors, that is renin and the uh, changes occurring in the kidney will lead to mild to moderate hypertension. So these three features happen in inflammation of glomeruli. Now, what are some key points which we need to know? You have said that hematuria occurs, right? That is blood in urine. And this will be seen in the urine on urine examination as RBC cas. So RBC cas and dysmorphic RBC cells will be seen in the urine. And oliguria will lead to uh, decreased glomerular filtration rate and decreased urine output. And the hypertension will be in the mild to moderate range, not severe hypertension. In some cases, because of all of these changes, what have there might be edema as well. And the edema is usually in the subnephrotic range. It's not as prominent as in nephrotic syndrome, but it still might be present in nephritic syndrome. So that's about nephritis. Having said that, now we move on to the pathogenesis of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or post-infectious glomerulonephritis. What happens here? Initially, a group A streptococcal infection occurs. So let's write that down. Now, where does it occur? It occurs in either the skin or in the pharynx. Do all the strains of streptococcus lead to PSGN? The answer is no. The strains which are involved are most prominently the type 12 strain, the type 4 strain, and the type 1 strain. These three strains are most commonly involved in the pathogenesis of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Then what happens is that these streptococcal infection resides, and after one to four weeks, after one to four weeks, the Streptococcal antigens, mainly the streptococcal exotoxin B antigen or the glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. That is the streptococcal exotoxin B or the glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. These three antigens, through the circulation, they will initially reach the endothelium of glomerulus, right? Below the endothelial uh, layer, they will stimulate the formation of an immune complex which will get deposited subendothelially that will lead to the formation of subendothelial complexes and these immune complexes what happens is that they will stimulate they will do two things that is first they will get deposited on the subendothelial layer and secondly what they do is they stimulate inflammation the Im the inflammation occurs resulting in first one is the leukocytic infiltration so leukocytes infiltrate into the different layers and secondly, what happens is that there will be proliferation of all the three layers, that is the endothelium, the epithelium, and the mesangium. Proliferation of all three layers of the glomerulus. These changes occur in response to inflammation, which is stimulated by the immune complex deposits. Now, as the disease progresses, that is, as the deposition occurs further and the inflammation occurs 
continuous choker, what happens is that the immune complexes will pass through from the subendothelial side into the subepithelial side. So now here we have both subepithelial deposits and the subendothelial. And in addition to that, we will have as I have said earlier, there will be leukocytic infiltration. So here we have the leukocytes which infiltrate into the mesangium. The leukocytes infiltration will occur and there will also be proliferation of endothelial cells. So new endothelial cell proliferation will occur. These are the endothelial cells. When the endothelial cells proliferate a lot, what happens as a consequence? As a consequence, the size of the lumen will get reduced, right? These are the changes which occur in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So to sum it down, what happens initially is that there's going to be a streptococcal infection in the skin or pharynx. One to two, one to four weeks later, the streptococcal exotoxin B uh, antigen uh, or the glyceraldehyde phospho phosphate dehydrogenase antigen, they will get deposited onto the endothelial cells and the one to four weeks is actually the time for production of antibodies against these antigens. So these antigen antibody complexes will be found initially on the sub endothelial side and later they will uh, move into the epithelial side leading to the formation of sub epithelial deposits. Now these immune complexes they will stimulate inflammation and as a consequence of inflammation there will be two things that is leukocytes will infiltrate into the all the three layers along with that they will stimulate the proliferation of all three layers that is endothelium, epithelium and the mesangium. So those are the changes which occur in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. With that, we now move on to the part of morphology. So we have said that the kidney in general is now hypercellular, the glomerulus is hypercellular, so the kidneys will get enlarged and swollen. So we'll have enlarged and swollen kidneys. Now let's diagrammatically represent what we have just drawn earlier. That is a diagrammatic representation of the microscopic changes. So we begin with the changes in glomerulus. When we look under the light microscopy, we can observe the following changes. As I have said earlier, there are going to be enlarged glomeruli. So there is going to be a hypercellular glomerulus. The glomerular matrix, the endothelial cells are going to proliferate. There is going to be leukocytic infiltration in the mesangium. And because of the proliferation of endothelium, the obliteration of lumen will occur. These are the two main changes which occur in the glomerulus of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Now we move to the part of tubules. So in the renal tubules, as I have said earlier, because of the inflammation, the RBCs, the capillary walls are damaged. RBC cells will enter into the filtration unit and they will get filtered and they will pass through the renal tubules, right? And as a result, these tubules, they can activate or stimulate tubular damage and tubular inflammation. As a consequence, what happens is that we can see or we can detect RBC gas in the tubules or in the lumen of the tubules. Along with that, the interstitia of the kidneys will get inflamed as well. So these are the microscopic, light microscopic changes which occur in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, that is hypercellular glomerulus, obliteration of the lumen, RBC casts in the lumen and inflamed interstitia. Next up is the findings that we see on electron microscopy. So we had said that there are going to be deposits, right? That is immune complexes are going to be deposited in two regions. That is especially in the earlier stages in the subendothelial region and in the later stages, it's going to be in the subepithelial area. So these two areas, that is the areas where the immune complexes are deposited are going to be electron dense areas. So we can say that there will be subepithelial and subendothelial electron dense deposits. The feature of these deposits are they are discrete, that is they are not present entirely, they may be present at points, certain points giving them a discrete deposition rather than a diffuse or continuous deposition. And along with that, they have this characteristic appearance. The appearance of electron dense deposits in electron microscopy is said to be hump like, that is the hump of the camel. So there is going to be a hump like deposits. Next up we move or we describe the finding on immunofluorescence as the term it suggests immunofluorescence gives a fluorescent color to the immune complexes. So in all types of nephritis, there are there could be either of the two types. So immunofluorescence could be either here we have a granular type or here we have a linear type. As we can see the difference here, there is granular kind of deposition or fluorescence can be seen, which means that the immune complexes are scattered and present at present as discrete elements 
throughout the glomerulus at different different points whereas when we examine here we can see a complete uh, fluorescence right which means that all of these regions where the fluorescence are present there is electron dense immune complex deposition which means that the deposition of the immune complexes are complete and diffuse either of these two patterns are present in our case we had said that in post streptococcal glomerulonephritis there are going to be discrete deposits of immune complexes which means that we should have a granular pattern right so the immune immunofluorescent finding in post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is going to be granular type not linear type linear type is seen in another entity which we are not going to discuss in this video so with that we have finished the pathogenesis and the pathologic findings that is the morphologic findings now we move on to the clinical features and how the presentation occurs by now it is easy to predict it so the child will present with fever with non-specific symptoms such as fever and malaise nausea so these features when do they occur they occur one to two weeks after a pharyngitis infection or a skin infection so one to two weeks after the pharyngitis or the skin infection these changes occur and in addition to that we have the main changes the features which are suggestive of nephritis that is first one week there could be oliguria there could be decreased urine output complained by the parent and then there could be sign of hematuria now how does the hematuria present as hematuria is blood in urine hematuria might present as cola colored urine so the urine will have the color of cola these findings uh, in a child of 6 to 10 years which is the most affected age group are suggestive of with a history of streptococcal infection are suggestive of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis what are some additional findings which we can see the additional findings could include one there could be mild edema as i have said earlier it's not as prominent as the uh, nephrotic syndrome it is going to be mild and every renal edema starts in the periorbital region that's where the renal edema usually starts so since it's mild it will be usually in the periorbital region alone and then there could be hypertension which could be mild to moderate not severe when it comes to adults in adults the presentation is atypical and the presentation is usually in the form of hypertension the other features may or may not be present edema periorbital edema might also occur in the adults so with that we finish the part of clinical features now we move on to the part of laboratory diagnosis when it comes to diagnosis there are going to be serum findings and then there are going to be the urinary findings we can begin with the urinary finding so in urine the first finding is going to be that the urine output is going to be decreased so there is going to be oliguria and we have said there is going to be hematuria that is blood in urine which in microscopy which we can see as the rbc's or rbc casts are seen in microscopy so these are the urine findings and as i have said earlier edema is there due to the damage of the glomerulus proteins can get filtered so there is also a possibility of mild proteinuria which I, as i have said earlier it's not in the range of nephrotic syndrome or as prominent as in nephrotic syndrome but it may still occur when we come to the serum findings again once we know the pathology we can identify it so we had said during pathology that the complement pathway is activated right complement pathway is the main pathway which is involved and because of the complement pathway when the complement pathway is activated and the complement factors are consumed in this process there will be hypocomplementemia in the blood in addition to that we will find antibodies to streptococcal pyogenesis exotoxins and ga pdh so the main antibodies which we can analyze or find in the blood are one is anti-streptolysin O and the other one is the presence of anti-DNA is B. So these two are suggestive of a streptococcal infection. So those are the laboratory findings. Now we move on to the part of prognosis. So prognosis again there in children and in adults we'll discuss. When it comes to children, 95% of the cases the children recover. There is a very minute fraction that is less than 1% they may progress to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis that is it's going to progress into a more severe form and in some cases what happens is that these children will later develop or the, there is going to be prolonged glomerulonephritis leading to chronic glomerulonephritis when it comes to adults 60% of the cases there will be recovery of the patients spontaneously Whereas in the reminder, what happens is that the features will persist. That is the clinical features such as hematuria, hypertension will persist forever. And in some cases, 
it may develop into the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or chronic glomerulonephritis. When we ask about the treatment, there is not much of a treatment. As I have said, it mostly affects the children and in 95% of the children, it will recover. There is nothing much to worry. The treatment is mainly maintenance. That is, we maintain the sodium and water balance. So that's what we need to know about glomerulonephritis. That is a post-infectious type of glomerulonephritis. There are several other types, but the pathogenesis of most of these types are immune complex mediated. So that's it for this video.